This is Newsroom. Hello and welcome from Johannesburg in South Africa. I'm Yevon Janssen. The show is live. It's broadcast from our studios in Auckland Park. We're also streaming live on YouTube as we speak with our whole show then available on our YouTube channel all of the time. The electricity outages have seen residents protest in South Africa this week. We also look at racism and tertiary institutions in South Africa and we check in with Nedbank's Let's Make Winter Warmer campaign. But first, Katrine gives us a news update. Good morning, I'm Katrine Malan, and let's take a look at what's been happening in the news this morning. The Farlem Commission of Inquiry continues today with the appearance of a highly anticipated witness, only known as Mr. X. He's expected to shed light on the events leading to the killing of 34 mine workers at Marikana on the 16th of August 2012. Mr. X has admitted to killing a few people during the London strike. He has been under the witness protection program and is one of the key police witnesses. Hopes for an end to the five-month-old platinum strike have been dealt a blow. It has emerged that trade union AMCU has tabled additional demands to the agreement that was reached in principle last week. On Monday, AMCU confirmed in writing to Amplats, Implats and Lonmin that it had received a mandate from its members to finalize a deal. The three companies say if granted, AMCU's new demands would cost them nearly one billion rand. Power utility ESCOM again last night pulled the plug on power supply due to pressure on its electricity grid. The power utility said that if the demand for electricity was not reduced, it may need to implement rotational power cuts. Thousands of households and businesses have been affected by recent power cuts. Parliament says it will study and respond in due course to the Electoral Court's findings against IEC chairperson Pansy Klakula. The court has recommended that a parliamentary committee find Klakula guilty of misconduct warranting her removal from office. It follows public protector and treasury reports that found Klakula had committed irregularities in an IEC office lease deal. Moving abroad, U.S. President Barack Obama has been discussing the growing crisis in Iraq as the Sunni-led insurgency continues to move on Iraq's largest oil refinery. Obama yesterday told congressional leaders that he doesn't need new congressional authority to act, discussing his upcoming decision on possible military intervention in Iraq. U.S. defense officials have confirmed that Iraq has asked Washington to mount air strikes. And then in sport, reigning world and European champions Spain were dumped out of the 2014 FIFA World Cup in Brazil last night. Chile beat Spain 2-0 to secure their and Netherlands place in the World Cup second round and eliminate the holders. Chile and the Netherlands, who beat Australia 3-2 earlier on Wednesday, both have six points and their meeting in Sao Paulo in, on Monday will decide the group finishing order. Remember, all these headlines are available on our Facebook page. You can also follow us on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. Yevon? Yeah, thanks very much, Katrin. Very good morning if you've just joined us. Electricity outages around South Africa have the citizens literally up in arms. This week, Soweto residents took to the streets to voice their disapproval. Around 100 protesters blocked roads with rocks and burning tires. The residents then went on the rampage demanding that Eskom and the city of Johannesburg urgently resolved the sporadic outages. Well, today we are joined by Eskim spokesperson Andrew Etzinger. Very good morning, Andrew. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure, Eben. This specific uh, Soweto problem, has it been dealt with now? It has been dealt with uh, on a temporary basis, but there is an underlying issue in many areas of South Africa which actually has nothing to do with the national grid. Mm -hmm. We uh, produce power at our power stations and then transmit that through to homes around the country. What happens in particular areas is that uh, we are finding illegal connections and non-payment of electricity, and that tends to increase the consumption in that area dramatically. And the local infrastructure is simply not able to deliver power uh, to those residents on a consistent basis. So we can have oodles of power nationally, but at that particular point in network, we have a constraint. And this is the case in Soweto, unfortunately. High levels of, uh, of non-payment. And, uh, of course, homes that are not paying for electricity would tend to use a lot, a lot more than they would if they're, they're paying. And mm -hmm. then illegal connections, backyard dwellings, etc. a big problem in Soweto. So what we have done is engaged with councillors, engaged with the community to point out the problem that, you know, it's going to take some time to uh, get together with the community, eradicate uh, non-payment, illegal connections, and restore consistent supply. 
And, and this is a process that you're going to be engaging with the community in Soweto specifically now? Yes, uh, of course, with Soweto there are uh, historic issues, there are legacy issues. It's not as simple as, as going in and removing illegal connections. There are, there are, are very uh, deep issues that need to be resolved uh, within, within Soweto, between the community and ESCOM and, and government as, yeah. to, as to how to get through it. So it's not a simple fix. Unfortunately, again, our ne network was designed with a certain capacity in mind, yeah. um, and, and it's just inadequate given the, the, the doubling and tripling of the consumption that one would normally expect in the area. So, so just to conclude this uh, Soweto story, it, it was then a not load shedding as people claim it to be. Correct. They say, oh, we, the power grid went off at 6 p.m. every day uh, for the last six weeks. That's what some people uh, say. But it's, it's not because there was load shedding in the process. It was because there was a, a, a surge in the, on the grid and it had to be dealt with because people were not paying and there were illegal connections. Correct. So there's a substation right there which takes power from the grid and again and distributes it to and that substation is simply not big enough to yeah. handle the, the load at that point on the network. Let's move on to what uh, the Gauteng MEC of Human Settlements, he issued a statement pleading with ESCOM to improve its communication and, and I'll quote him, he says we would like to plead with ESCOM to improve its communication about the load shedding timetable especially during winter, uh, winter season. Is there a breakdown in communication somewhere? Of course we take the MEC's comments very seriously and from it, it's vital that we get our communication absolutely perfect. Mm. Uh, having said that I don't think it's bad I, I, uh, from the point of view that uh, there are m many channels. SABC ca carries numerous reports, yeah. our power alert, for example. I'm here this morning and we're talking about specifically <laughs> about this. So every opportunity we have to, to interact with the, 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 the public through, for example, in Soweto, uh, public forums, but also through the media, we certainly take. Our load shedding schedules um, are, are almost perfect, uh, but there are mistakes as well that, that we need to rectify. So we certainly uh, have taken note of the MEC's comments and, and we'll need to engage further to understand the specifics of how, how we can improve. But uh, I'm glad to say certainly since 2008 a lot has been done. Yeah. A good load shedding schedule is on our website, it's available through our call centres. We're working together with municipalities also with their load shedding yeah. schedules to host them. So I think we're getting better all the time, but we're not perfect. Phase one load shedding was announced late last week. Uh, just, just run us through that and, sure. and, and what citizens should be on the lookout for in the next week or two. Unfortunately, from Wednesday evening, last Wednesday evening, Thursday evening, and then again on this week on, on Tuesday evening, we did have a shortage of, of supply and we did need to resort to what we refer to as stage one load shedding. It's, uh, it's light load shedding, if I put it that way. It's not as deep as, the, as previous load, sh load shedding, fortunately. Yeah. Um, in terms of the rest of this week, uh, uh, tonight is going to be tight again between 5.30 p.m. and 6.30 p.m. Again, a load shedding schedule on the website would be followed. Friday, Saturday and Sunday should be fine and we're hoping that of course next week we'll, we'll be in a position to avoid it. But uh, certainly the outlook for this week um, and tonight in particular, not good, uh, very cold uh, early yeah. morning, that doesn't, uh, that's not a good sign. High temperature sensitivity of our demand at the moment, it's going to be tight between 5.30 and 6.30 again tonight. Let's talk medium term and the outlook. The outlook is a little bit better now in the medium term, it seems, yes. with Madupi coming online yes. early next year. Uh, is that accurate 100% or, or should we not count our chickens? No, 100%. Uh, what we must bear in mind though is that uh, while Madupi will be coming online, there are six generators at Madupi. It's only the first which will be coming on stream by the end of this year. Yeah. In six month intervals, the others of course will be coming on, but it's going to take some time for the situation to completely normalize. But of course, uh, these are giant generators. Even one will make a, no. a tangible difference to the grid. And of course, the Kusili power station, very similar to Madupi, yeah. uh, will, will be following or, uh, hotly on the heels of Madupi as well. So there's definitely light at the, uh, at the end of the tunnel. We're really hoping that uh, you know, the, the uh, power constraints will be resolved as soon as possible, in particular by next winter. Let's make, no. let's, let's, uh, I think as a partnership between us, either consumer and and, and, and yes, can agree that uh, load shedding must must stop. Yeah, and, and people must understand that uh, this is a this is a legacy problem that we're dealing with, and it's going to take a while for us to get out of this hole. But just in conclusion, what's your message then to uh, South Africans who are feeling a little bit perturbed and in some instances angry, and some want to protest because Certainly. of the shortages that we're suffering at the moment. Sure, so the message is we, we, we apologize from Eskom's side for, for the inconvenience, for the frustration, uh, and for, uh, of, in certain cases, actually business activities which have been in, in, interrupted. We, 
Second would be to say that uh, we really appreciate the support of the public and business who have cut back on cons consumption. We have seen uh, last night, for example, a big drop. In fact, we didn't actually need to pull the plug last, mm. last night in any area around South Africa because we had a great response. So really, thank you, yeah. South Africa. And that's so the partnership I'm referring to. And the, really consumers, the consumer behavior is starting to change a little it, bit. It is, and it's making a massive difference. As I said, uh, contrary to what we had expected, uh, last night we didn't actually need to resort to any form of load shedding around South Africa because we saw an unexpected reduction in demand, and that's clearly the consumers yeah. coming through. We really do appreciate that. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you for coming in today and, uh, well, sharing with us uh, where we are uh, on the grid here in South Africa. If you uh, change your behavior, basically, that's what we all have to do. Use a little bit less power. Go out during peak time, switch off the unnecessary lights. Don't let the heater burn on its own in the lounge. When you're not there, it's a simple thing. It's not rocket science. We can all chip in and we can all make a difference. We're all in this problem together. Together and winter is going to be very, very long and very, very cold. So let's all try and chip in. Meanwhile, it was a stormy day in Parliament as opposition parties strongly criticised President Jacob Zuma's State of the Nation address. EFF leader Julius Malema caused a stir on his debut, accusing the president and the ANC of selling out the revolution. First up, the ANC. The economic theme of the president's speech emphasized the ANC wants to accelerate service delivery and radical economic transformation. It wants business to partner government and implement the NDP. The ANC wants to stimulate growth and drive its infrastructure program. The National Development Plan is not just a plan of government, but a plan for the whole country. It is a people's plan which has been adopted by the majority of our people and stakeholders. We are therefore calling on all South Africans to rally behind the implementation of this plan, including labor, business, and all organs of civil society. A maiden speech from the new DA parliamentary leader. Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, it is indeed my sincere honor to address this house today. I would like to greet the president and uh, wish you all the best in the next while and say it's good to have you back in good health, sir. Then he didn't mince his words. The president spoke about cleaning up. His speech was an ideal opportunity for him to come clean about South Africa, come clean about our economic crisis, come clean on job creation, come clean on the electricity crisis, come clean on the failing education system, come clean on the public protector's report, come clean on the national director of public prosecutions, but he did not. Alema. Dressed in red worker overalls, the EFF Julius Malema is another new entrant. He said his party would not respond to the call of cleaning up the country on Mandela Day. I'm sorry, Mr. President. I won't be cleaning on Mandela Day. I will be involved in a more productive activities which will leave long-lasting legacy and remembrance of our world icon. The unrepentant Malema was called to order several times. No, I can't be told what to say. Honorable Malema. Order, members. Point of order, members, chair. The order, order, chair. Point of order, chair. Honorable order. members, I am quite fit to sit on this chair. Honorable Malema, we have taken you through the rules of these houses. You will desist from making disparaging remarks on the persons of the honorable members of this house. Oh, point of order, chair. Order, chair. Point of order, chair. An old battle is revived. Immediately after 2011 elections, the Honorable Mrs. Kamakosa Msibi led her new party into a coalition with the ANC. And after the 2014 election, the President rewarded her with a position <laughs> on his oh, mission. On a point of order. I'm not going to worry myself about the utterances of Dr. Telezi. I think it is bitterness, it is sour grape, and he is being disingenuous and spiteful. Therefore, I'm not going to belick myself. Yes, we all call that Parliament will be a very interesting place in the next term with so many new faces in Parliament. But let's take a look now at the front pages of the world. What is the world talking about? 
The Wall Street Journal in the United States reflecting on one of our headline stories this morning, President Obama's decision on possible military intervention in Iraq. Obama yesterday told congressional leaders that he doesn't need new congressional authority to act. There you have the New York Times as well. Then your Spanish papers this morning. It was a tear, a hug, and Spain's King Juan Carlos has formally abdicated the throne after 39 years as monarch. Then, of course, the Spanish not overlooking their ignominious World Cup disappointment last night. They went out and, uh, with a whimper, really, from the tournament. The end, says Marca, one of the top publications in Madrid, in Spain. What are you talking about on social media? What are you passionate about? What do you want us to share with the world? At SABC Newsroom, that's where you can send it. That's where you can interact with us. Curate Zeda Zeda Luiso says, this is my plea on behalf of ESCOM. We all want to watch the World Cup, so please beat the peak or we're going to have rotational load. He says, not everybody watches football. Some people like to say that. Lorna says, ESCOM only business who doesn't want business. Yeah. <clears throat> this is a legacy problem. Sam Klungu, let's stop grumbling, complaining, and help Eskom. That's right. Switch off the heaters. Switch off the lights with that you don't need in your house. We can all halve our electricity usage instead of complaining. Brian says, shouldn't have to deal with cable theft and load shedding. Eskom City Park, I pay my rates and taxes. Sort your ship out. Well, Brian, you don't live in Europe. This is South Africa, sir. Cliff Featherston says, municipalities that do not pay ESCOM should be first to suffer rolling blackouts, a.k.a. load shedding. Uh, well, there, there's, a, there's a novel idea for you at the city of Cape Town, he says. No, a novel idea indeed. Today, we remember actor James Gandolfini, who passed away last year on this very day at the young age of 51. Gandolfini received three Emmy Awards and one Golden Globe for his role as Mafia crime boss Tony Soprano. Let's now take a look at some of those great Soprano moments. the role and who owned his space. Tony Soprano will live forever. This is Newsroom. We'll be back after a short break. The story of Joyce has captured the heart of many and instilled hope to those who had succumbed to the pain of living with cancer. I am going through breast cancer and of which is stage 4. And the doctor said I left only with 25% to live. But, Baba Turinke cancer. Baskeba Lapa. Baturinke cancer. My employer called me and told me that I mustn't come back anymore because of they found someone who's going to replace me. Welcome back. This is Newsroom on SABC News. Africa, 
is a hot topic in the international sourcing arena. Manufacturers from all over the continent are taking advantage of the growing interest at Source Africa, the textile, apparel and footwear trade event that started in Cape Town yesterday. Source Africa is now in its second year and provides a platform for African manufacturers to connect with both international and intra-regional buyers. Now, to tell us more, we are joined by Anton Poplet, the African Business Development Manager for Galvner Performance Fabrics here in South Africa. He joins us from Cape Town. Good morning, Anton. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, guys. Yeah, good morning. Africa's economic outlook looks good for the next decade. Tell us about how this interest is playing out in the sourcing arena. Lots of interest, guys. Uh, lots of opportunity at the moment. In the next two days, we have uh, the Source Africa event, which is including buyers uh, from Europe and from the U.S., uh, traders and buyers from the African continent, from all over. It's really, really looking positive. Tell us a little bit more about the event and who will be there and, 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 and what is the importance of this event uh, for, for the trade? The importance is that we, we, we starting to drive the opportunities that Africa can provide a stable environment when it comes to uh, fabrics, garments, footwear, uh, the opportunity that people can realize and come over to the continent and say, well, you know, I'm looking for some footwear, I'm looking for some suits or some shirts and things like that. And it's starting to open up the door so that people can realize what the opportunities are and that it's not only based on what comes out of the East. That, uh, that sort of leads into the next question. You guys are then confident that in the next decade or so we'll be able to put South African manufacturing, especially within apparel and textile, back where it belongs and where it came from? A decade is far too long. Short term, you're looking at, uh, you know, within the next uh, two years or less, the opportunities have, have already grown in the last, say, six, seven years. Uh, leading up to the point of Source Africa at the moment. It's being backed and supported by some big players out of the U.S., uh, some big brands. And the guys are starting to say, well, I know that you can produce it, but let me see and let's talk about volumes and let's talk about quality. And this is where we are. We, we can produce a fantastic quality, a, f a fantastic finished product, with it, whether it's footwear or, or apparel uh, and, and, the, and even fabrics. And the guys are going, well, cheapest. I didn't even know that. I didn't know it was possible. You know, how, how do we do it and who do we talk to? And that's exactly what the event talks about. You know, we started seminars yesterday and uh, the first seminar was jam-packed. I mean, uh, on, on the second seminar, mm. they had to uh, find a few more extra chairs. It was fantastic. That's, that's brilliant. I want to talk to you about fabric because uh, I have no doubt that uh, our seamstresses and, 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 and uh, our, our, our workers are amongst the best in the world, but I've always felt that we do fear fall a little bit short on the fabric side of matters, not only in South Africa, but also on the continent. How do we change that, or is it changing? It is changing, and we have taken a big knock. South Africa specifically has taken a huge knock when it comes to fabric producers. We've, we've had a few losses of some, of some big guys, uh, Frame Textiles, Mediterranean, and, and, and a few others. But people like Galvanor, the company that I work for, are starting to pick up the pace. And there's a few other manufacturers on fabrics. There's guys out of Tanzania, people out of Kenya, a few out of Nigeria that are starting to pick it up. But I think part of the problem is people are still worried about price. And that's starting to change. You know, guys are saying, well, I'm tired of, of asking price. I want a reliable, decent quality. And that's why they're coming to the locals. And they're saying, what can you do for me? Everything I'm wearing today is produced within static. Uh, mm. The jacket is produced, uh, sorry, the fabric for the jacket is produced by Galvanor. Uh, the denims I'm wearing at the moment is from uh, Mauritius. The shirt is from uh, uh, South Africa. So there's a lot of op opportunities that people just don't know. And this is what we're saying. Come talk to us. Let's, let's grow it out. And that outfit looks as good as any I've seen in Italy or anywhere else in the world. Just uh, tell us about the vision your business has for the industry, specifically in South Africa, over the next five to ten years? The next five to ten years, we're actually envisioning uh, the local tender process and, tend, uh, and local content to be one of our biggest drivers, and it's amazing that the government has started to enforce that. Uh, we have the DTI, they contact us saying, listen, these people want to import from the east. We're going, well, why? We can produce it over here. There's no need for them to do that. So in the next five to ten years, we're envisioning local tender process for South Africa to be uh, on a much bigger drive. But then we're also talking to the countries uh, within SADC that are starting to open the doors locally 
and work with the South African Bureau of Standards and say, mm. listen, what is the scope and what are the opportunities? In the next five years, I would imagine we're going to start opening up a few more uh, weavers and finishers uh, out of e East Africa. It's already happening. Ethiopia is starting to grow quite big at the moment. Egypt's uh, looking quite smart. Kenya's looking really good. I had a few drinks last night with some people out of Tanzania. And, and there are some big numbers. You know, there are some really, really amazing numbers at, at the moment. The demise of the textile apparel and footwear industry in South Africa is grossly exaggerated and it looks quite good. Thank you for joining us, Anton. No problem. Thanks very much, guys. Well, that's uh, Anton Poplet to, from Galvanor Performance Fabrics joining us and telling us a little bit about, well, Source Africa that's happening in Cape Town. Started there yesterday uh, and the outlook, well, for the sourcing in the sourcing arena and also textile apparel and footwear in South Africa, the outwear in the next decade is not so bad. These guys are working around the clock to make it happen. Now, we move our attention to Bloemfontein. The rates, racially motivated incident at the University of the Free State six years ago shocked the entire nation. Now the university has come up with a way of repaying the four victims that appeared in that degrading video. The university will today launch a company that will be owned by the four women in the video as an attempt to restore their dignity and also ensure their financial security. Dr. Choice Macheta, Vice Rector, External Relations of the University of Free State, joins us from Bloemfontein. Good morning, ma'am. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Evan. Tell us a little bit about what, what, what uh, the events uh, of today will entail, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Uh, the event of, of today, as you remember, six years ago, we had the raids uh, case and uh, we had to agree to certain things to make sure that as a university we restore dignity of our people and and irrespective of circumstances irrespective of the kind of work they do now the event of today it's launching the company registered on behalf of our five colleagues and it is, it's interesting every time we talk about the four women there's actually one man among them uh, so it's five colleagues four women and one man we launched the company today, but they have gone through a process of training. When we registered the company in 2012, we took up uh, a process where we had to hire a company that would be able to train, to mentor, and coach them for a period of 12 months. And we thought it would be a very easy task and later realized that we actually needed a company that would be able to train at a lower level uh, than many companies normally train, and a company that would be able to train and mentor in the Sesotho language. Mm. And in, 20, in 2012, we managed to get a company. A small, uh, uh, it's a small company that trains uh, smaller companies, and it was very easy for them to connect uh, with the five colleagues. What was important in appointing this company, the five colleagues needed to be comfortable with the trainers and they had to build a relationship because yeah. they were going to spend 12 months together. It had to be a company that is willing to be flexible. When the colleagues do not understand something, they would be, be prepared to repeat and repeat yeah. until we are all sure that it's done. Now, today we're launching this company of uh, the uh, registered for the five colleagues. The name of the company is Mamello Training. Mm -hmm. And Mamello means perseverance, taking into account the many years of uncertainty yeah. Uh, for, for these colleagues. And uh, from the University of the Free State side, uh, we are also uh, providing them with branding material uh, for their company. But apart from branding material, from January 2014, we provided startup mat uh, material, machinery, equipment like computers and all, for them to be able to take off. And part of their mentorship uh, entailed us giving them a, a two buildings at one of our campuses, the South yeah. Campus, for them to start mentoring, sort of running their own company. Yeah. And when we got to June, we gave uh, the company the whole campus to run. That's fantastic and, and, news. But tell us yes, about the perpetrators in this process, ma'am. It's wonderful that you're yes. storing dignity and helping these people, but what about the perpetrators of this heinous act? Uh, uh, that we saw. Are, are, are they in any way involved in this process of healing that you as the university have now decided to go upon? 
Oh yes. Uh, if you remember, if you remember in 2011 when we had the reconciliation ceremony, yes, the four students came, and there was a session before the formal reconciliation session, where the five colleagues and the four students came into contact for the first time. And remember, before then, they were very close, and and the five colleagues used to express that these young people were more like their own children before the event. And we created space for them to talk and to ask one another why, why they allowed this to happen mm. and when, when they had so much trust. And uh, be, beyond the reconciliation uh, ceremony, it had to be an individual uh, commitment of the individual four students to say, how do they get involved in the process of healing? And we said, because it's a reconciliation process. If you remember, uh, the, one of the four students lost his job in Namibia at that time. And we sat down with the South African Human Rights Commission and the university and all other partners, and we said, if we are reconciling, we have to help these students also learn and grow out of this process. And we said, as a university, we will involve them from time to time at the Institute for Reconciliation and Social Justice, when they, we have programs that require uh, uh, their involvement. But I want to say there's one of the four students who is uh, uh, working for the University of the Free State. Remember, there was a huge issue about why. Why we appoint a student who did this and that at the university. Uh, and, and we said, we are talking about reconciliation. And as South Africa, South Africans, we are very good at, at punishing. And we are not very good at, at bringing people together again to rebuild and work together. And for us, for this young person to come back to the university and to work, it said, can you imagine when the whole university community and the community around South Africa did not, uh, looked at you negatively, almost hating you, and you take it upon yourself to come and work in the same community, uh, the growth that comes with allowing yourself yeah. to be judged, allowing yourself to be, you know, be, be uh, uh, punished. And when you see this young person work with other young people, I think the learning has been great. Yeah. But it goes even beyond that because as a university we said we want every student of the University of the Free State to grow. We don't want to wait for another incident and say and deal incident by incident. Thank we you, Doctor. We've run, we've run out of time, unfortunately. Sorry for cutting okay. your word there. Uh, fantastic no, work on this, on this process, and, and, and we hope that the healing finally comes full circle. Thank you once again. That's Dr. Choice Thank Maketa, who's the Vice Director, External Relations at the University of, Pre of the Free State in Bloemfontein. Of course, uh, there was a racially motivated inc incident there, much publicized a few years ago. They're dealing with it today by, well, restoring the dignity of those involved, really. Let's now take a look at what you're talking about on social media at SABC Newsroom. That's where we live on Twitter. We've also got a Facebook page that you can go to, but this is Mr. Cebola says, Bantu Olamisa, Astrak Takula, could have saved herself from embarrassment and humiliation by resigning when the court process was initiated. Uh, that comes in. James Stein says, what would this mean for the election results? Probably nothing, he says. It has nothing to do with the election results, James. Ito Malang says, when will the IC pay up? Its volunteers remain unpaid. Those lucky enough only paid half. Can't he? What was the deal? Hashtag Takula. Tulani says, no to soft. Don't ever get with your pansy down. Stolen, says Tulani. Trying to be clever today. Obed says, and the INC head is headed to the door. Not quite 100% yet, but it's a process that's underway. Let's take a look now at our Facebook page. Of course, it's Newsroom on Facebook today. You will see there the bail application of the two men who were arrested for the theft of 112 rhino horns will continue today. You can also read more on why platinum producers say mining union AMCU's new demands are unaffordable and on government seeking radical transformation in the energy sector to deal with power constraints. All of that and more on our Newsroom Facebook page. Now this week, a young South African man made international headlines after he surprised 
his Missouri girlfriend of three years at Kansas City International Airport with an unforgettable marriage proposal. Take a look. Love was in the air today at KCI. A young man from South Africa got help from an entire jet full of passengers to ask his girlfriend to marry him. Sarah Hollenbeck was there for this emotional moment. This was a big surprise for Overland Park native Ashley Crock. She thought she was picking up her boyfriend at the airport, but little did she know her life would change forever today. As passengers exited flight 3774, each handed a daisy to Ashley. She giggled nervously, smiling and thanking each person. Once Ashley had an armful of daisies, George was the last passenger off the plane, and he had quite a surprise. They embraced, he got down on one knee, and he popped the question. George also wrote Ashley a song, which United Airlines played over the PA system. I've been planning this since, like, January, so it's been a, been a long wait, and a, it's hard to keep secrets. George and Ashley met in Cape Town, South Africa, while she was serving as a missionary. You can see Ashley here with one of the young children she helped on her journey. George says seeing how much Ashley cared for the children really touched his heart. They fell madly in love, and you can bet Ashley was quite surprised. I'm overwhelmed. I'm shaking. I did not expect this at all. So I know all of you at home are wondering, well, what did she say? Ashley, of course, said yes. Reporting at KCI, I'm Sarah Hollenbeck, 41 Action News. That's how they do it in America. South African guy goes all the way, proposes. Very lucky guy that she said yes. Imagine the embarrassment if she said no. Anyhow, we'll be back with Newsroom after a short break. The trial has begun in Seoul of the 15 crew members on board the South Korean ferry that sank in April. More than 300 people were killed. Most of them were children. The captain, 68-year-old Lee jun sok and three other senior crew members were charged with homicide and face a maximum sentence of death. Primetime News, daily at 6 p.m. on SABC News. Your world provides trusted world, continent and local stories. We deliver breaking news from across the globe and information on the latest top stories on business, technology, politics and sport. Analysis of the big global business and economic issues as they affect consumers and investors. Make sure you don't miss Your World, weekdays between 11 and 12 midnight. We keep the nation fully informed. Welcome back. You're watching Newsroom on SABC News. Let's have a look at the news making headlines this morning. The Farnham Commission of Inquiry continues today with the appearance of a highly anticipated witness only known as Mr. X. He's expected to shed light on the events leading to the killing of 34 mine workers at Marikana on the 16th of August in 2012. Mr. X has admitted to killing a few people during the London strike. He has been under the witness protection program and is one of the key police witnesses. Hopes for an end to the five-month play old platinum strike have been dealt a blow. It has emerged that the trade union AMCU has tabled additional demands to the agreement that was reached in principle last week. On Monday, AMCU confirmed in writing to Amplats, Implats and Lonmin that it had received a mandate from its members to finalise a deal. The three companies say if granted, AMCU's new demands would cost them nearly one billion rand. Parliament says it will study and respond in due course to the electoral court's findings against IAC chairperson Pansy Tlakula. The court has recommended that a parliamentary committee find Tlakula guilty of misconduct warranting her removal from office. It follows public protector and treasury reports that found Tlakula had committed irregularities in an IEC office lease deal. 
Power utility Eskom again last night pulled the plug on power supply due to pressure on its electricity grid. The power utility said that if the demand for electricity was not reduced, it may need to implement rotational power cuts. Thousands of households and businesses have been affected by recent power cuts. Moving abroad, U.S. President Barack Obama has been discussing the growing crisis in Iraq as the Sunni-led insurgency continues to move Iraq's largest, two largest oil refinery. Obama yesterday told congressional leaders that he doesn't need new congressional authority to act, discussing his upcoming decision on possible military intervention in Iraq. U.S. defense officials have confirmed that Iraq was asked, uh, has asked Washington to mount air strikes. Remember, all these top stories are available on our Facebook page. You can also follow us on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. Winter is here, and it is here to stay. And for those less fortunate, it means a tough time ahead. NetBank has launched a unique winter campaign, joining forces with the Living Artists Emporium, who will be painting 10 paintings that center around the theme of Make a Warmer Winter Happen. These 10 paintings will be then auctioned off next month, and the funds raised will be used to buy more blankets for those who need it most. Now, joining me today in studio, we have Masada Rashikuni from NetBank and Conrad Bo, one of the artists from the Living Artist Emporium. Guys, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Good morning. Thanks for having us. Masada, I want to start off with you. It all started with a big giant ice bed in the beginning of the month. Just tell us at the beginning of this month how the campaign started and what's the thinking behind it. Look, I think uh, when we started, as we, NetBank does a lot of uh, corporate social investment activity. And one, one of those things is obviously uh, doing something for the, you know, for the needy, particularly in, in winter. So we have to find a way because there are many other companies and organizations that actually collect blankets. So we wanted to find an innovative way to engage the South African public so that they can get involved uh, in donating uh, you know, blankets for the, for the less fortunate. Now, you had a bunch of celebrities at this event. to Tell us about uh, the event itself. And did you also climb onto that ice bed? Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, so what we really did was uh, we actually created a, a large ice bed. It's about... Uh, uh, two meters by three meters by one and a half meters. So it's a very large ice bed, very slippery. In fact, once you <laughs> we kind of got on that. And to kind of get it working, we then tried to get celebrities and also media personalities, uh, you know, to make sure that we get, you know, everybody behind uh, uh, the campaign. So the whole idea was to dramatize the coldness of winter. So if you lay there, in fact, we got some of the celebrities to lie there for about a minute and people had to tweet and they had to get at least uh, 50 tweets before they can actually get off, uh, you know, the ice. And uh, so I think it's, it's, it's been a really innovative way of you know, trying to deal with the social ills uh, in, in, in South Africa. Now, this is a five-year, if I'm correct, like this is a campaign that's been running for five years. And this year, you guys have joined forces with the Living Arts Emporium, with the artists there. And that's where, Conrad, you come in. Conrad, you're one of the artists who will be painting um, for this event that will be auctioned off at the end of the month. Can you tell us more about why you decided to become involved with this campaign? Um, now, we're actually very uh, pleased that we could um, work together with NetBank to give back to the community. Um, the Living Arts Emporium itself is almost like a platform for artists to, you know, for artists to make themselves almost like e economically viable uh, as an artist because a lot of people with skills um, have all the skills to become an artist, but they don't have the necessary business uh, business foundation to really make themselves as an artist that can sustain themselves. So that is where the Living Artists Emporium comes in. And also with, our, with, with NetBank itself, you know, we get the opportunity to showcase our work and also to um, show people what uh, the Living Artists um, Emporium artists are capable of. Now, can you give me a bit of your background? We've just seen some of your work on screen. Okay. Where it all started for you? Um, yeah, I started um, to become a professional artist in 2003 and I started with something called journalism and then in 2008 I wrote the manifesto for an art movement called Superstroke. And can you tell us a bit more about this art movement, Superstroke? Uh, Superstroke is the opposite of um, an art movement started by Takashi Murakami in Japan called Superflat. Uh, super flat refers to the flatness of Japanese society, um, sometimes also the superficiality of it, according to Takashi Murakami. 
and their stuff, or their art is very like smooth and polished. And Superstroke is almost like the opposite of that. The the art is very expressive and also very instead of uh, very flat, it's it's very texturized as well. And we just take it from there. Now, will you be incorporating this expressive art in uh, the painting that you will be working on? Yes, uh, the painting I'm planning to do for the campaign is um, I'm going to paint it in half tone dot style and I'm going to use some photographs of the campaign itself and that is going to be the foundation for my painting. Ms. Leda, I just want to come back to you. Have you identified some of those who really need this campaign in their life? I understand you have already donated some blankets. Yes, in fact, uh, on the night we actually had uh, two organizations, Joburg Child Welfare and also Itlokomeleng, which is an organization in Alexandra. So looking for the young people and also the, the elderly, because those are usually the vulnerable people in society. Today, as we speak, we've got uh, something in, in the Free State and also in Mpumalanga. So we're making sure, as a national organization as well, to make sure that we cover the whole of South Africa. Then how can people become more involved if they want to donate and if they just want to send an SMS to donate or anything like that? Yes, it's a very simple. I mean, it's a few SMS in South Africa, SMS winter uh, to the number 400 40017. So uh, winter to uh, 40017. Or if you want to actually co contribute, you can go on netbank.coza. There's actually some d uh, details if you want to actually contribute to, into the, the Netbank winter campaign account. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. That was Conrad Bow and Masada Rachikuni from NetBank. They're talking about the latest NetBank campaign, Make a Warmer Winter Happen. You can also get involved. You can go to our Facebook page. We will upload all of the information of how you can get involved. And you can also follow us on Twitter at SABC Newsroom. Yevin. Yeah, thanks, Katrin. What a fantastic campaign. I think one of the very best ones going in South Africa at the moment. We all know how cold it is out there. Very few of us know what it's like to be out in the streets and feeling the cold on your skin. Finally, well, we move on to look at what our digital team has been busy with the last week. Joining me, SABC Digital News Production Editor, Christelle de Toy. Very good morning to you, Christelle. Yeah. And then our, our producer, Tsepo Teolo, who will be filling us in on all things World Cup this morning, Tsepo. Morning, Yemen. You don't have to look so sad. It's a wonderful job you have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, what, a, what an interesting World Cup it has been so far. Eh? Yeah. Um, very unpredictable, very interesting, very exciting. Um, yesterday's fixtures, um, we saw the Netherlands taking on Australia. Australia, I, I, I'd rather say, like, props to them. Yeah. No one gave, gave them a chance following a Net Bank, um, Netherlands 5-1 um, trouncing of uh, Spain the other, in their opener. Um, they gave it their all. They should be proud of themselves. Um, they throw in everything that they had, but the, at the end of the day, it was not to be on the night. You know, uh, the yeah. Netherlands are winning 3-2 on the night. Again, Robin, Robin van Persie, uh, Wesley Snyder, they were exceptional on the night. Um, they took, the main talking point of the night was the, the Spain and Chile um, fixture. Um, what a night it was again. Yeah, so uh, Spain sort of went out to the whimper, really. I mean, uh, <laughs> as the defending champions, I thought that... You know, they came to play, but they obviously abdicated the same day as King Juan Carlos. Yeah, yeah everyone is talking about the Spanish pain, you know, this morning. Um, Spain uh, becoming the fifth uh, defending world uh, champions uh, to bomb out in the initial stages, in the group stages of a World Cup. It's the first time that a defending champion has lost the first two games. Yeah, though, yeah they, were, they were the first to lose. So the this first, is the um, worst performance by a defending champ ever. Exactly. And a um, couple of topic, talking, talking points around that game whereby uh, people were surprised with the starting lineup for, for Spain. Uh, Vincent uh, Dabowski, he decided to not to go with um, Sh um, Xavi, Xavi. In, the, in the starting lineup. He decided not to uh, go with Pique. Yeah. Uh, but people have been asking as well. As, um, there's players like uh, up front, Fernando Torres. He was not there. You know, you got Juan, you got Juan Fernando Mata. Torres hasn't been around for the last five years. Yeah, right? well, but he, he was he was an alternative. You know, on the day uh, you got uh, players like Juan Mata. You got players yeah, like. You have uh, to, I, I suppose, suppose you have to trust the coach. He's installed to make those decisions. And 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 you know, the last time the guys won the World Cup, nobody complained. I suppose. But let's talk about tonight and moving forward. Is England going to go out tonight? England, I think, is going out. Uh, they're not going to stand any chance. Um, I think we're going to we're going to give it to Uruguay. You know, we they have uh, the Lucia factor yeah. uh, that's going to come into play. 
Um, yeah, they, they're not gonna make it this time around. I'm sorry. And, and what are we doing on, our, on, on what are we doing on the on, the, on our digital platforms with regards to uh, uh, the World Cup special reports, all that sort of stuff? Uh, what other interesting stuff is out there for for the viewers and the users? We have a special report that is going up. Um, it is a one-stop shop um, for all things World Cup. You know, we have exclusive previews, we've got reviews. Um, we also have, you know, analysis, you know, we've got player profiles, team profiles and all that. So it's up there, the results, you know, and the fixtures and the highlights as well for people to see. Wonderful stuff. Well, results, highlights, profiles, fixture lists, it's all there. Uh, Tsepo is the man who's, uh, well, keeping us up to date with all things World Cup. Now, Christophe. It's not just about the World Cup, is it? It's been a big news week, been busy news week, State of the Nation address, a uh, whole lots of other stuff on a sad note. We, we lost the late Eddie Zondi this week. Uh, that must have gone down like a lead balloon, I would think. I think that's about the right analogy. No, it's, it's been a very busy um, news week in terms of Eddie Zondi. Today is his memorial service at the Standard Bank Arena. So we have a producer there who will be live tweeting it, who will be taking video, who will be taking pictures. So, uh, uh, Standard Bank doesn't pay for that anymore. So, it's now the Ellis Park Arena. I, apologies, that's how I heard it this morning. And I'm sure NetBank is not too impressed since they came and chatted <laughs> to us today. <laughs> but yeah, so we've got the, the Eddie Zondi memorial service today. We've also got Mr. X testifying, oh, yes. which we spoke about. <clears throat> Pardon me. So we'll be live streaming that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And the Sona debate has got everyone talking. Um, the video yesterday of yeah. the Honourable Malema um, is available on our YouTube page still. And we're off streaming again this afternoon at about 2 o'clock, 2.30. Yeah, there were a couple um, of laughs in Parliament yesterday. I'm sure those laughs will be up on the site and so forth while he was making the speech. And absolutely. So and of course, today is the ruling as to whether he contravened the rules of the House in saying that the ANC massacred mine workers at Marikana. So we could see him being th thrown out of Parliament well, in his second day there, not the first day. I oh, I expected it to be on the first day, though. Uh, <laughs> not wanting to call Mr. Ramaphosa, the Honourable Mr. Ramaphosa. Yes. It, was, it was a very interesting day. But just tell us about some of the other... I see you've got Thing Link, Thing Link images. What is that? You know, the, the, the nice thing about online is we get paid to play. Yeah. Uh, we can make <laughs> cool stuff. So we've, of course, had the State of the Nation address. And we created an image where you can basically compare what was said in 2009 in the State of the Nation address. You can then go to the January ANC manifesto. And yeah. You can then go to the latest, to the June sonar, ah, okay. and interact with it and see exactly what was said about the different points. Um, and which jobs. promises were made and so forth. Absolutely. And then you, okay. you can track it. So we've got okay. a special report up on, this, on the State of the Nation address oh, where you get that analysis where you get the, the the comparisons and the checks in terms of what has actually been delivered uh, we've even got a video of Parliament there uh, because a lot of people hear of Parliament but we don't actually know where yeah. our laws are made um, so we've got someone who shows us around Parliament yeah I see it's um, Lazuka Jacobs is it uh, spokesperson Jacobs, yes. yeah, yeah. And you can see there he's we, we've got very cool technology called a GoPro which is a tiny little camera okay. um, with which you can shoot all this nice stuff um, on the go Brilliant, man. That's fantastic. That's the kind of stuff that you don't get uh, anywhere else in South Africa, especially not on television, only on this show. Thanks, Christelle. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Tepo, thank you for popping in. I'm sure you'll be with us again next week yeah. talking all things World Cup. Um, I hope... Uh, what's your, what, what team are you favouring? I want to put you on the spot here in front of the, in front of the nation. Well, I'm, uh, I'm fencing Germany. I'm fencing Germany, Germany, a man yeah. with great sense. Great sense, common sense. That's my team. I'm with you. The Germans have played the best football. Of course, Deutschland über alles. That's how we, that's how we roll. <laughs> Let's take a look at what you say on social media. Please remember, at SABC Newsroom is where you can send your contributions. No, we're not going to. Uh, Florence, our d director, says that we've run out of time. So it's thank you for joining us. Newsroom broadcast live from our studios in Auckland Park, Johannesburg. Between 9 and 10 a.m. every weekday morning. The show repeats at 2 o'clock in the afternoon if you miss it in the morning. And then there's a rebroadcast at 5 a.m. the following morning if you've been out of town or out of the country. We also stream live on YouTube at that time. A whole show is available on demand on our YouTube channel. This is SABC News. You're watching Newsroom, where we love it in the morning.